Hello, welcome to Chapter 1, Intro to Government in America. I um, just want to give you a little overview of this chapter. Politics and government matter. That is the single most important message of this book. Despite the fact that government substantially affects each of our lives, youth today are especially apathetic about politics and government, whether because they feel they can't make a difference, the political system is corrupt, or they just don't care. Young Americans are clearly apathetic about public affairs. And while political apathy isn't restricted to young people, a tremendous gap has opened up between the young and the elderly on measures of political interest, knowledge, and participation. So the goal of this Government in America book that you guys are going to be reading this year is to assist you in becoming well-informed citizens by providing information and developing critically analytical skills. Um, so for this chapter, these are the learning objectives you should be able to answer or understand at the end of this chapter, studying this chapter, distinguishing among the fundamental concepts of government politics and public policy, understanding how government politics and public policy are interrelated, asserting how people can influence the government's policy agenda, being able to describe the basic concept of policy-making system, determining the central principles of traditional democratic theory, uh, examining the three contemporary theories of American democracy, pluralis plural, 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 I can't say it, pluralism, elite, and class theory, hyperpluralism. Discuss and analyze the challenges to democracy presented in the textbook, and lastly, understand how the c components of American political culture, liberty, which are liberty, um, egalitarianism, individualism, laissez-faire, and populism contribute to democracy democracy and shape government. So by the end of this, you should be able to um, know and understand these different concepts and um, learning objectives. All right, so let's get started here. Um, first, we're going to look at politics and government. Has, what does it, has it, why does it matter? Um, many Americans, especially young people, are apathetic about politics and government. And that's what I said in the very beginning. Um, there has been a huge gap, a uh, tremendous gap has opened between uh, young, which is under 25, which is, would be you, and elderly, defined as over 65, on measures of political interest, knowledge, and participation. Um, so this gap has been growing and growing um, over time. And um, it's, this, it's my hope that after you guys read this book, you will be convinced that paying in Paying attention to politics and government is very important. Um, government has a substantial impact on the lives of all of us, and um, we have the opportunity to have a substantial impact on government itself. Or you do, not just me, but you. You guys have a huge um, opportunity to do that. It's not, it, but you got to be willing and able to participate in politics and government to do so. So there is this gap, and that's my one of my goals is hopefully that you will have. Um, a desire to want to be involved and um, participate in some form of matter. Okay, so government. Um, the definition of government is it consists of those institu institutions that make authoritative political, I'm sorry, authoritative public policies for society as a whole. Um, so these institutions can be, and the main, the big institutions are, um, are is the executive branch or like government agencies, the courts, and, and ultimately also the Congress. These are huge institutions that have authoritative, um, that make authoritative public policies for us as a whole, everyone. And this is at both at the state and national level. Um, the courts here and locally, the, the police, the mayor, the governor, locally here in Nevada or the city, um, they have, those are institutions that can make public policy that affect us as a whole. Um, four key institutions that make up public policy at the national level are Congress, President, and Courts, and the federal agencies, the bureaucracy. This is going to be like, you know, your FAA, FBI, um, FTC, uh, FEMA, um, any acron acronym you can think of that deals with the government. Those are all bureaucracies, and they all have authority to affect public policy on everyone. So, two questions you must ask about governing. How should we be governed, and what should government do? Um, when it when it, when you're looking at government and politics, these are the two fundamental questions you want to ask yourself. Because 
um, there may be some things that you don't think that should be governed, and while other other things you think there should be governed involved 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 in that policy, and and what are those things? What what are those things, and how should it be done? Should it be very hands off or more hands on? Should the government be more involved and less involved? And so these are two questions you'll be asking yourself. Um, you should be asking yourself when it comes to any public policy or anything to dealing with the government politics itself. What do governments do? All right. Well, regardless of how they get their power, all governments have um, certain functions in common. And <clears throat> one of those functions is maintaining national defense. Governments must m maintain national defense, protect us from the people that's in the Constitution, that's what it's, um, they, they, they pledge to do. Um, provide public goods. The government must provide public goods, things that everyone can share, such as clean air, which I, I don't know if that's a really um, good example, but also like pu um, public parks or library. These are public goods that everyone can share um, here, at, here locally. Um, post offices, another public that everyone can use and share. So public goods. Um, three, thirdly, number C, have police. Government must um, have police power to provide order as when uh, Chinese security forces crushed the student protests in um, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square back in 1989. Um, so not, that's not, you know, not American um, government, but even all governments, they provide these things and police powers is one of them, even Chinese communist countries, they provide that. And also another example, the National Guard was called to, in, to restore order in Los Angeles after the 90, 1992 Rodney King verdict. Um, people started rioting and it was the uh, National Guard who came in and tried to preserve peace and get people um, out of the streets and um, you know back to civil matters. Fourthly, what do governments do? Uh, governments socialize the young into political culture Typically through practices such as reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and daily exercises at public schools are ways that the government socializes you in this culture of um, you know, being proud of being American and um, valuing the, the, the principles behind America. And lastly, what does the government do? They collect taxes. Um, Governments collect taxes to pay for the services they provide us. So all those public goods that are shared by everyone, they they don't they're not free, because actually ultimately you do pay for it through your taxes. And so these are all functions that all governments at all levels, national, state, and local levels, um, share. They have in common. All right, let's go on to politics. So that's what government is. Politics. Um, politics is defined as. Um, whom we select as governmental leaders and what policies they pursue. So when we vote, when we elect people into office, we are determining by who we select to go in and be leaders and when they go into office, they're going to affect the policies that they, what, which policies they're going to pursue um, depending on who's elected or not. So that's what politics. Whom is, um, or another way of saying is who gets what, when, and how. And this is um, this is from a defined by Harold D. Laswell in your book. That's how he defines politics as who gets what, when, and how. Uh, political participation refers to the ways in which people get involved in politics. So <clears throat> if you're wanting to, uh, there are different ways of participating in politics. It's, um, the easiest, most, um, the easiest probably way is to vote. But there are multiple ways of part politically participating. And um, that's a political participation. The ways in which people get involved, you can also not get involved, which would be another way of being, that's, that is actually participating, is not involved. Um, but sometimes people are just into one issue. There's one issue they're very passionate about. These are single issue groups. And um, these are interest groups whose members will vote on a single issue, such as pro-life or pro-choice groups that ignore every, everything about the politician's stance and everything except abortion. Um, you know, so that's their single issue. That's all they care about. They don't care about what they what the politician feels on taxes or how they feel about um, global warming or um, tax. Or I'm sorry, um, let's see, military. So it's just a single issue. So that's one way of being a political being par participating is maybe you're a single issue group person, abortion. That's all you care about, and you only vote based on that alone. Um, so politics. It's just who gets what, when, and how. Um, 
determining how whom we select as government leaders, and that's going to ultimately affect policies that they pursue. Uh, so that's that's the politics in a nutshell. There. All right, um, policy making system, uh, Roman numeral four. The system is a process by which policy comes into being and evolves over time. So this system has has it been evolved has been evolving over time. The the system of whom who gets what, when, and how. Um, it didn't just happen. It wasn't happen as soon as the Constitution was created. Something has been creating and moving and changing ever since um, the, the beginning of our country. Um, so in a democratic society, parties, elections, interest groups, and the media are key link as institutions between the preferences of citizens and the government's policy agenda. So these, these different institutions, these linkage institutions as they're called, because they link you, the citizen, to the big institutions of government, the president, the Congress, the courts, um, by the parties we align with, the people we elect, and these interest groups that we get involved with, and also the, um, how we interact with media, what we watch on media, all of these link you, the citizen, to the government itself. Um, without them, you wouldn't know, and it goes vice versa, it also links the government to the citizen. It helps the, the, the government to know or, and understand what the citizens are wanting to, wanting to um, get past, possibly. So it goes both ways. So that's part of the system, these linkage institutions. Um, when people confront government officials with problems they expect them to solve, they're trying to influence government's policy agenda. So, you know, these institutions help, um, help the people solve, help the government solve problems that the people have. And this is called policy agenda. This is the agenda of the government is to, um, you know, um, lower, lower um, expenses or lower, or lower um, government wasting on on um, on useful on or, I'm sorry, um, useless um, programs in America. So that's the agenda. Of maybe the Tea Parties. Um, the people have a problem, and they expect the government to you know cut cut where they can and not spend as much money. So that may be the policy agenda of certain politicians. Um, that's part of the system. Political issue arises when people disagree about a problem or about a public policy choice. Um, so sometimes the agenda can change just because of something that arises during um, during a crisis, let's say, like, you know, just like the whole, the whole um, economy collapses. So you know this political issue is now new. There's a new political issue. The the agenda is the agenda is going to change, and where these government, uh, I'm sorry, these politicians are going to pursue. Number four, in the end, ultimately, is that the product of the government and politics is is public policy. Um, <clears throat> so that as it goes back to back to the very beginning, of the system here. After these these linkage institutions help us connect to the government. It's going to affect their their agenda, and even when issues arise, it's going to affect um, it'll affect the way they're going to what what course they're going to choose. And at the end, basically, this changes or this affects what the public policy is going to be, what the public wants, what the public is ultimately trying to um, hope the government solves. So, policy impacts are the effects of policy. Are the effects policy has on people and society's problem. And the, th the thing is, even if you're the minority, you're, this is going to affect you. So these policies that get passed by Congress and by signed by the president, um, they ultimately are going to affect, has an effect on everyone in, in the society and try to hopefully eradicate society's problems. Um, so one, there are many types of public policies that are going to affect everyone. Um, Including congressional statutes and statutes are just laws, presidential actions like um, you know ending the don't ask don't tell um, policy in the in the military, court decisions, budgetary choices and regulations. All of these um, affect people and problems of society. Having a policy implies a goal. People who so people who raise a policy issue usually want policy that works. Um, the goal is to change something, make something better. So having a policy, whatever that may be, you're trying, you're, you have a goal of trying to do something. And thirdly, translating people's desires into public policy is crucial to the workings of democracy. And this goes back to the whole gap between young and old. Um, when people don't have desires or don't have 
goals that they want that want um, they feel is crucial to being changed, um, it doesn't really it doesn't help out in democracy. It doesn't it, it makes a democracy much much more weaker. And um, ultimately, in pol uh, number th or C here, policies can be established through uh, interact in action as well as action. So you know, like I said, if you don't if you don't get involved, that's that is a form of participating, and um, inaction is just as much of a, as a action as as getting involved. Um, by not caring and not doing anything, you're basically selling you're letting the government do what they want um, without any um, pressure from the public. So that's the system. Um, all right, let's look at democracy. What is democracy? Uh, democracy is spreading throughout the world in areas that were formerly undemocratic uh, more and more. However, people around the world um, define democracy differently than, and few Americans really understand what it fully means. So it is spreading, but you know, like Iraq, you know, is a newly very fragile democratic government that's been um, created. Um, and that understanding what that means is different amongst everyone. All right, so let's define democracy. Um, the writers of the Constitution were suspicious of democracy at first. They didn't, they didn't um, necessarily agree with it. And that's basically because, you know, if, if the majority wins, then um, the, what happens to the minority? What about the minority? Um, so they were, they were skeptical of it. Um, in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, he defined democracy as government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, so that's his definition. The book's definition is democracy is a means of selecting uh, policymakers and of organizing government so that policy represents and responds to the public's preference. So, you know, it goes back to politics. It's Democracy is... However we select, however we vote for the, these people, these leaders that are going to be in charge of making laws and policies, how the government is organized so that the policies that get passed represent the people back in America, back in your state, back in your city. That's the book definition. So what is, uh, what's the traditional democratic theory? It rests upon several principles that, spe that specify how a democratic government makes its decision. So one, a traditional, for number one, um, what makes a traditional democratic theory? Um, according to democratic theorist Robert Dahl, uh, he says there's five criteria that are essential for an ideal democratic process. And one of these criteria is equality in voting. Again, this is what a traditional dem democracy would look like. Um, equality in voting. The principle of one person, one vote is basic to a democracy, and that's something we do have here in America. You know, when we vote, it's one vote. No one's vote counts more than the others. It's one, one person, one vote. Um, second criteria, according to Robert Dahl, is effective participation. Political participation must be representative. Um, so, and again, that's when we vote for people who represent us back in Congress or as the president and so forth. So effective participation is political participation that must be represent representative. Number three, enlightened understanding. And what he means is that is hopefully is there's, there's a free press and free speech. Um, those, are essential, those are essential to having a civic understanding and enlightened understanding of what's going on in government. Um, so today in America we do have free press, although it's it's highly motivated by money. Um, but um, we do have a free press and free speech. There is free speech here in America, but there are restrictions to that. It's not you can't just openly say whatever you want. But free speech there are, there are there are the um, there are aspects of that here in America as well. And the fourth criterion: citizen control of the agenda. Citizens should have the collective right to control the government's policy. Agenda, and this this is t totally key in democracy. If the citizens don't control the agenda, then um, their voice isn't going to be heard, and their their policies that they feel should be implemented are not going to um, take place. So, having a citizen that controls agenda, um, some can argue that that's not the case here in America anymore. And the fifth criteria um, that would represent a traditional democracy 
is inclusion. Citizenships must be open to all within a nation. Um, so everyone, just basically, there's no one, no one has, um, everyone in, the, in America has a voice or a chance to participate in government. It's no one's excluded from it. Um, so those are the five criteria that would, according to theorist Robert Dahl, makes a traditional democracy. In addition, democracy must practice majority rule and preserve minority rights. So, um, you know, if you're the min if you if, when a in a democracy, the minority is the one that's going to be um, um, maybe affected the most because they're going to be against whatever the majority wants, but they still need to be um, have rights that, that are preserved for them. So, the relationship between the few leaders and the many followers is one of the is, is one of representation. Um, the closer the correspondence between representatives and their electoral majority, the closer approximation to democracy. Um, and that can be kind of hard to do sometimes to be to have um, representatives that are that are closely uh, re resemble the whole of America. But that is that is a that's a key part of democracy. Um, having few leaders and many followers is one of the representation. You're going to have to hopefully they hopefully they match. Um, those people's feelings when it comes to policy. And um, let her be here. Most Americans feel that it is vital to protect minority rights, such as freedom of speech. Um, even though you're a minority, you still, you know, having that right to speak out against it. And maybe hopefully one day down the road, you may change the, the majority and you become the majority instead of being the minority. And that's vital, um, having that right protected for the minority. All right, now the three contemporary theories of democracy. So that was, uh, letter C was traditional. These are contemporary theories of American democracy. Um, the first one is called pluralist theory, and it contends that many, that many centers of influence compete for power and control. So many, meaning many um, different groups of people uh, of influence are going to have the opportunity to compete for control of government. Um, groups compete with one another for control. With no one group or set of groups dominating, so it's not just the the big corporate businesses that are dominating. Um, that's one group, but they're not the only one that's going to dominate. There's multiple that are competing, and all um, are no one's dominant over the other. There are multiple access points to our government, with power to disperse among the various branches, levels of government, and there are multiple access points to our governments through lobbyists, through um, uh, campaigning, through um, interest groups, raising money for ele um, elections, um, uh, let's see, uh, getting, you know, so those are a few off my head, but there are multiple access points to our government to get involved to um, try to influence policy. C, bargaining and compromising are essential ingredients to our democracy. So according to the pluralist theory, pluralist theory um, being able to bargain with different Groups and come up with a compromise is essential. Kind of like what happened with the raising the debt ceiling. There was a bunch of bargaining, compromising going on between Republicans and Democrats, which are competing groups. Um, ultimately, trying to come up with a a, a good product or good policy. Letter D. Electoral majorities rarely rule. Um, as Dahl puts it, all active and legitimate groups in the population can make themselves heard at some crucial stage in the policy-making process. So at some point in time, and this kind of goes back to having multiple access points, um, the electoral majorities, um, they're, gonna, they're not going to just rule over everyone. So it's kind of, it's kind of this whole pluralist theory, pluralist theory is kind of like everyone has equal, equal ground everywhere. And lastly, the recent increase in interest groups has cited as being a plural, as cited by pluralists as evidence of pluralism, having all these different interest groups actively trying to compete with each other for power, um, give us gives evidence of a pluralism theory going on democracy here in America. All right, so that's number one. The second theory, contemporary theory, is the elite in class theory, which says that. Our society, like all societies, is divided along class lines. Um, according to this theory, there is an upper class 
that rules, regardless of government organizations, um, they are the ones in control. So you can say the rich, the white, um, in America they rule. Wealth is the basis of class power, like I said, the rich. Um, a few powerful Americans are the, actually the ones holding the, all the, they're pulling the strings of when it comes to policy making or maybe big business and this power is at the center of most elite class theories as well. And then there are critics or people who, who believe that they will argue that elitism is increasing in recent times um, due to huge corporations, multinational corporations um, here in America and around the world. And they're, they're the ones who are um, pulling the strings and able to make policies that, have, that have, uh, help them out. So that's the second contemporary theory. The third type is hyperpluralism, um, which is pluralism gone sour. Uh, so it's like it's pluralism to the 10th degree. Uh, many groups are so strong that government is unable to act. Um, they're at the will of these groups. Government is basically, they're at whatever these groups say, they must do. They're just basically um, are controlled by these, these different interest groups or um, that are out there trying to influence policy. Um, there are too many groups with access to the different levels, so having too much access to the government is um, the cause of that, that the, the government's unable to act. Um, these groups have multiple ways to both prevent policies they disagree with and promote those that they also support. Um, and that you know, could be by financially supporting a candidate or not financially supporting them. Um, having the access to politicians is going to uh, um, can cause hyperpluralism. And um, lastly, when politicians try to appease every group, the result is confusing, contradictory, and muddled policy or no policy at all. Just, you know, if, if they're at the whims at every group that comes knocking on their door, um, nothing really gets done and it's basically gridlocked and a, a stall takes place. So that's hyperpluralism. Those are the three um, um, contemporary theories of democracy, and you know all three of those. There, there are there are elements of all three of those different ones here in America. All right, so challenges to democracy. There are four of these challenges. How can an average citizen make decisions about complex issues? Today, it's hard to be an expert on, on everything that our government has to deal with. Um, you know, you can be an expert in foreign policy, but doesn't mean you're good. You're gonna be you're gonna be knowing what's great what, when it comes to social security or social um, problems. So, and there's and that's just Medicaid, Medicare. Those are just complex issues just as themselves um, for one average citizen to even know what's best for everyone. So, again, part of a, a good democracy is having a citizenship that's knowledgeable and understands um, policies, and that's that's a challenge. Number two, what if citizens know little about their leaders and policy decisions? Um, it's so important that when you vote that you look up and review and look at what, where these politicians stand on different policies and hopefully they align up, align with you and your ideas so um, when they're in office they're going to affect your po policies in a positive way for you. Number three, is American democracy too dependent on money? Um, you look at the the last presidential election. That was record record numbers and uh, money raised, and um, maybe it is too dependent on money. And number four, does American diversity produce governmental gridlock? So having so many different groups, does that produce gridlock? And at times, I would say yes, it does. There are just too many voices out there, and um, no one is able to be. No one's satisfied because nothing. No one can be. No one is. No one likes any of the ideas because there's so. There's always a group out there that's not going to agree, so that could cause gridlock. So those, these are all challenges to having a a democracy that is rich and um, effective. All right. So uh, having a good political culture is key to understanding American government. Um, if America is unified by these ideologies and culture, um, it's going to help this democracy that we have. So having America that is unified by 
ideology, and we'll talk about what ideology, the way you, the things you believe in, basically, in this culture of America, um, political culture, is key, uh, which is unusual compared to most countries with strong nationalistic characteristics with a, and a longer history, um, in a, compared to America. All right, so five middle elements of political culture that shape our democracy, America's democracy. So what is this political culture ideology? If you know, these are these are basically these five elements we're going to look at are the things that unify us, um, and that's key to understanding our government. So number one, letter A, liberty, which I'm sure you would say if you were if I were to ask you what is what is America democracy, what does that mean to you? You may say liberty. That might be one of the things you say. Liberty is one of uh, Thomas Jefferson's inalienable rights that we have given to us by a creature or a, or a, a god, and a cornerstone is the cornerstone of the Bill of Rights itself. First ten amendments to the Constitution. Egalitarianism. Okay, I can't say it really well. Um, which is equality of opportunity, especially social equality, um, has promoted increasing political equ having increased political equality, or um, maybe one or is one element of American democracy. Basically, you know. Everyone has an equal opportunity to do well or have this American dream that um, we all hope to have one day. Number three, individualism. Uh, Americans' de individualism developed in part from the Western frontier and the immigrants that um, went over, that, that came over to the West um, um, to get away from government oppression, even from the very beginning, coming from England. Getting away from that that um, tyranny is part of this individualism that Americans. That's part of this our idea, ideology, and our culture here in America. Uh, number four, laissez-faire economics. Uh, basically, laissez-faire means it's French for hands off. The American government taxes and regulates less than most countries at its equivalent level of development. So, you know, sometimes we may feel. Like our government's too involved, but compared to other countries, they're still not as evolved as other. They have their when it comes to economy, they're not involved in every little detail as you may think compared to other countries. And lastly, number five, the fifth element of our culture here in America is populism. The common ordinary citizens are idealized in American politics by both liberals and conservatives that claim to be their protectors. So both the Republicans and Democrats they claim to um, protect and Try to preserve this, these ideas for the ordinary citizens, not the not the rich. That's why you always, sometimes you hear the Democrats, liberals, say, you know, we're we're tired of the the big corporations having um, too much influence. You know, we're we're here to defend the common people. So that's populism, the ordinary citizens. So all of these these are just five elements that um, are part of our culture and our um, democracy here in America, which is key to understanding American government. If you understand these, you kind of have a good, you have a good, good um, start on American government. And um, lastly, there are scholars who debate whether there is a cultural war going on in America, meaning do these, do some of these people, do people in America not, do they question what, what these, um, these five elements of our culture, do they um, think some of these, they think differently, basically. And that's what this cultural war is, that people are, these ideas are changing and these are no longer the, um, the culture of America today. So now that we understand what political culture and ideology in America is about, um, yeah, in America, um, these are some questions you may want to ask yourself um, as I go through here, through these questions here about democracy itself, and do we have a democracy here in America? Um, number one, are people knowledgeable about matters of public policy? Are you knowledgeable about matters of public policy? Do they apply? Do the people who are knowledgeable do they apply what knowledge they have to their voting choices? Does that affect who they vote vote for? Are American elections designed to facilitate public participation, or is it designed to be confusing where no one wants to get involved? Um, 
does interest group system allow for all points of view to be heard or do significant bias give advantages to particular groups? Number five, do political parties provide voters with clear choices or do they intentionally obscure their stands on issues in order to get as many people to vote for them as possible? If there, cho if there are choices, do the, does the media help citizens understand them or do they only focus on the the front runners. Is Congress a representative Congress of American society? Does it represent America? Do they do they look and act like what American society does? Um, is it capable of reacting to changing times quickly or not? And lastly, does the president look after the general welfare of the of the public, or has it become too focused on the interests of elite? So hopefully, as you as I went through this, you are able to answer these questions and um, you know determine if not maybe America is a traditional democracy or maybe one of the contemporary ones um, based on how you answer these questions. And uh, lastly here are some key terms you'll need to know um, from this chapter and um, yeah hopefully now that you have a um, hopefully it helps you in chapter one understanding chapter one and introducing you to government as a whole. So just an introduction. Um, we're going to dive into more of these different things we touched on. Um, more, um, more intimately, I guess. I don't know if that's really the word I want to use, but um, look at them more closely. And um, see you then. Thanks. Bye.